I ask that question because it's an important one. How many civilizations are there? Finding it is something that might happen in the next few years. Well, there has to be because the universe is so vast and so old and there are so many stars. We have good evidence that life was present on Earth around 3.8 billion years ago. We don't know what time is that it started ticking at the Big Bang and you had a look at it now. The basic fundamental laws of nature don't care which way you run time. I think a very important question is, is there life beyond Earth? Um, now, of course, you might, most people would say, well, there has to be because the universe is so vast and so old and there are so many stars. But, but actually finding it is something that might happen in the next few years, let's say the next decade or two, because we have space missions out there. We have a mission called Mars Sample Return which is based on the Perseverance rover's samples that it has now collected on the surface of Mars. And, and we want to get them back to Earth to see if there's any traces that life may have existed or may still exist. There's a, there, there are two missions, one on the way and one about to launch to Jupiter's moon Europa, which are missions aimed at trying to find out whether that place is potentially a home for life. So I think the question, you know, it's one of the big questions, are we alone in the universe? Um, of course, you can never say, yes, <laughs> we're alone, but we might be able to say definitively, no, there is life beyond Earth um, in the next decade or so. I, I would say, by the way, that um, if we find life elsewhere in the solar system, it will be at best microbes. We're pretty sure of that in single celled organism. The galaxy, I mean, in the in the show. I asked I, I I asked that question because it's an important one. How many civilizations are there in a typical galaxy? And of course, the answer is we don't know. However, we, we can make some guess. And so I make my own guess in, in the show and I justify why I come to this conclusion. My conclusion is there might be very few intelligent civilizations in a galaxy. I asked a great friend of mine, actually, Sean Carroll, who you might know, the, the author and cosmologist. How many, what do you think? How many, on average, how many civilizations are there in a typical galaxy? And he said, none, <laughs> on the average. Ever wondered how the universe truly works? We travel the globe to bring you exclusive interviews with the world's leading minds, like Michio Kaku, Roger Penrose, and many more. From Nobel laureates to groundbreaking researchers, we capture the most brilliant conversations that shape our understanding of existence. This is World. Join us on our global journey to uncover the mysteries of the cosmos by subscribing now. Say, so, well, what do we know? What evidence do we have? We, you know, how can we speculate about these things? Well, we know we have good evidence that life was present on Earth around 3.8 billion years ago, which is interesting in itself because that's pretty close to the age of the Earth. So on this planet, as soon as the, the Earth had formed four and a half billion years ago, it cooled down, the oceans formed on the surface. Not so long after that, we have evidence that life was present. So that's the observation that we have. So you, that might suggest that if you have the right conditions, geological conditions, then um, I, I, I say that what, what kind of a thing is the origin of life? It's a transition of, from geochemistry to biochemistry. Whatever it is, you have a geologically active world and then you have a biologically active world. So given the right geology, perhaps it's not so unlikely that life begins. That, that's, all, that's what you can say from the, the evidence on Earth. It might, you know, it, it could be we're very, very lucky on this planet, but let's say that given the right geology. So that, that the strategy for looking for life beyond Earth in the solar system is based on that idea. That if you go to places where the, the, there was or still is liquid water, and you go to places where there's geological activity, and you go to places where the right chemistry, uh, we think, exists. And so that would be Mars in the past, perhaps Jupiter's moon Europa now, perhaps Saturn's moon Enceladus now, perhaps other moons of Jupiter or Saturn. Then, the, so that's the strategy. You go to the places where the geology looks right, and the chemistry looks right and look. And that's all we can do ultimately.
So I wouldn't be surprised to answer your question if we find some kind of life on those moons or perhaps subsurface on Mars. Um, I would be extremely surprised if it was complex life, by which I mean multicellular life. Um, and that's based on the fact that we have no evidence of multicellular life on Earth but back further than, let's say, a billion years at most, actually maybe six or seven hundred million. So the evidence from Earth is that life remains simple for something like three billion years. And that's why most biologists will say that whilst microbes might be common in the solar system, uh, complex life, it would be very surprising indeed if we found that. The, this is a current area of research. We don't know what time is. So, um, so in Einstein's theory of relativity, which is our best theory of space and time, um, that we, we have a picture of space and time woven together into what's often called the fabric of the universe. It's called space-time. And there's a notion of uh, distances on that surface. And, and they're measured by clocks. So, so a clock is measuring it. It, let's, say, let's say you have a perfect stopwatch that you start the moment you're born and you keep it with you for your whole life and you look at it now. Then that's measured your age. It's also, in Einstein's theory, measured the distance you have traveled over space-time during your life. That's fine, but that it assumes there's such a thing as a clock, right? So, um, so the age of the universe, by the way, is defined as the time that would be measured on a freely falling clock that had started ticking at the Big Bang, and you had a look at it now. So, so a clock that just falls freely through the universe. So that's, um, but it still doesn't say what time is. Um, so you will see discussions in the textbooks and online about something called the thermodynamic arrow of time. So it, it is true to say that, for example, the laws of nature, the basic fundamental laws of nature, don't care which way you run time. So, so they're, 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 they they'll run. So, so basically, if you know everything about some system at some point in time, then you can. The laws of nature will allow you to run that forwards to see what it's going to be doing in the future, or they will allow you to run it backwards to see what it would be doing in the past. So it's completely symmetric. But of course, there is a notion of past, present, and future. Um, it's complex, actually, in relativity to define what that is. But we feel it. We think the future is yet to come and the past has happened. So uh, we do know that that asymmetry has a great deal to do with the presence of this unusual thing in the past called the Big Bang, which was very highly ordered. It's got, technically, you say it's a low entropy. <laughs> and we have this idea of this, this a thing called the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us that entropy always increases. And so the, the future is in the direction of entropy increasing, right? So, so things getting more disordered. So, so th that's uh, an idea of time. It's called the thermodynamic arrow of time. But when you get into what a clock is and what it's measuring, you, you, could, go, you could go now online and you'll find a lot of research papers, uh, where, where the interesting fields of research, such as what, what's, the minimum, what's the minimum clock you can make You'll find actually that there are papers. I, I read one last week, which had which was a clock made of three atoms, basically, and and you you the, the the ticking of the clock is associated with light being emitted from the atoms as as electrons jump around in the energy energy levels. You do need what's called a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir for that to work. So a clock is a is a thermodynamic machine. It's like a steam engine. Right. So so it, 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 one way of thinking about clocks is that they measure the flow of entropy and so on. So the, the reason I say all this is it's quite technical language. The measurement we have is the time on that clock from the Big Bang to now, which is the time from when the universe was hot and dense to the present day. Um, now, our best theory of how the universe came to be the way that it is, is a theory called inflation, which has space time being present before the universe was hot and dense. So before the Big Bang, in that sense, we, we call the Big Bang the hot Big Bang now for that reason. 
Um, and then, then you get into questions about, well, what does it mean for the universe to have a beginning? For that, we need to understand what time is. And there are other theories, so-called quantum theories of gravity, which have been developed now, particularly actually in response to research into black holes, which are suggesting that space and time themselves emerge from a deeper theory that doesn't have space and time in it. These are theories called emergent space-time theories. And so you need to know. You, ultimately, my view is we need to know what space and time are um, before we can talk with confidence, e e even begin to answer the question, did the universe have an origin? Because we don't actually know what beginning a beginning is in a complete in a universe without space and time. <laughs> The oldest light in the universe, we know we, we've, we've captured that. It's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. So that was emitted mm -hmm. um, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, the, we, we know that because before that time, the universe was so hot that it was in what's called a plasma state. So it's primarily hydrogen and helium gas. But if you go back beyond 380,000 years, so earlier than that, then the universe was so hot that atoms couldn't form. So you have basically hydrogen and helium nuclei and electrons all over the place in kind of in like a soup. And that's opaque to light. Light can't travel through it. So you can't use light to see further back in time than, than 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, so, but we have a beautiful photograph of that light. By the, the, the most recent is taken by a satellite called Planck. And it's a, it's a remarkable image. And it's an image of the universe as it was at that time. But further back than that, you need to do something else. You need to use the neutrinos or, or gravitational waves, potentially. So our universe is expanding. Um, and that's uh, a discovery that was, it was actually, um, believe it or not, not, not quite a prediction, but it was, it was thought to be likely shortly after Einstein's theory of gravity was published in 1915. Um, so the idea that the universe can stretch or shrink the fabric, imagine space stretching or shrinking, was was noticed theoretically. And then in the late 1920s, Edwin Hubble, the American astronomer, did, demonstrated that indeed, if you look at distant galaxies, they're all moving away from each other and from us. And, uh, and, and by through those measurements, that's essentially what we feed into Einstein's theory to calculate the age of the universe. So we can measure how it's expanded and how the expansion rate changes over time. Um, so that's that's um, been known since the 1920s. So the universe is expanding and cooling. The second part of our exclusive interview with Brian Cox, diving deeper into black holes, wormholes, and quantum physics, is coming soon. Don't miss out. Follow our channel.